All right. So let's get started. So um, hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out and attending the webinar. Today I will be speaking on a topic that maybe you guys have considered or didn't even know was an option until now. So we're going to be discussing solver recycling and waste management for various applications and the options to recycle or possibly even sell your waste solvents. So I'll start by introducing myself. There we go. All right, so my name is Donald Maybell III. <laughs> yes, it is the third. And I am the evaporation specialist here at Buki Corporation. Um, I've been here for about a year, you know, taking on various responsibilities such as technical support, application support, as well as product management for several product lines. Um, in the past, I did work in a laboratory setting where we paid for a lot of our solvents and ended up costing more to actually dispose of our solvents to actually to purchase them. So that leading me into the fact that solvents, you know, if, if, if you don't know, they can be a necessary evil. So here I've listed a couple different examples of industries and applications where solvent use is pretty high. Um, in academia and industrial settings, there's a lot of solvents that are used for chemical reactions. These pro the products from those reactions are then run through various laboratory equipment, instrumentation, using techniques such as separation, purification, and then just analyzing those samples after the whole process is done. One thing that comes to mind is liquid-liquid extractions or even preparative chromatography purification where you run very dilute solutions through these instruments which uses a tremendous amount of solvent. And also afterward, afterwards, after running all these instruments, you also have to clean the glassware. So a lot of people clean the glassware with soap, rinse with water, and then do an acetone rinse afterwards to get you know, any last uh, residual um, contaminants off of the glassware. In process scale and manufacturing environments, the uses are a little similar, but on a way, you know, a lot larger scale. They're also used the solvents for cleaning, curing, flushing, and degreasing the glassware and equipment afterwards too. In the environmental analysis industry, it's not uncommon to use your roughly a liter or more to extract or analyze an environmental an <laughs> environmental sample. And this may be soil, sludge, even animal tissue. And this is done in labs, especially with high throughput, so they go through lots of solvent on a daily basis. And that also brings me to the natural product uh, market, you know, the industry, especially things like cannabis, any natural products for food or anything of that matter. Uh, when you're doing purification, trying to get target cannabinoids, trying to get at a, a target substance within your solution or say you have a crude oil, well when you run that stuff through prep uh, preparative chrom uh, chromatography you can go through massive amounts of solvent because everything has to be very dilute so that you can make those separations. And also in the biological market um, I do have an example of the histology department using ethanol, xylene, and water and paraffin wax for tissue studies as well, but we'll get into the examples a little bit later. So, you have two main options when it comes to your waste solvent. Do you pay to properly dispose of it using the guidelines designated by the EPA and RCRA, or do you save money by recycling it? Most people just pay to have it disposed of and end up losing on an opportunity to actually recycle it and use it. So, disposing of your solvents is extremely costly because one, you have to buy the solvent in the first place and then you pay the company to dispose of solvent and then you have to go back and buy more solvent. Well, when you do that, you, you know, they cart this stuff off in drums, they treat it in various ways. One way that the stuff is disposed of is they take it to a facility and incinerate it. So that can lead to a lot of dangerous fumes in the air. Um, another way that they dispose of this stuff is to treat it and possibly recover it as what well. and so you know if the company is taking your waste and recovering it well they're profiting from it when you could be profiting from it and also um, the you know when the when you pay to have this stuff transported they, the cost for the company to transport this stuff for you includes the transportation, the liability, 
and the disposal of these solvents. So, you know, these options are basically taking more money out of your pocket and putting it into another company's pocket, as well as even potentially creating harmful fumes and vapors for the environment. Um, but if you recycle, recycle the solvent, it can save you a lot of money because you can use the solvent multiple times. Let's say it puts money back in your pocket so you can buy cleaner solvent when you need to, and it's better for the environment because you're using it, a lot less solvent is being incinerated, and you know the environment's just one better place. <laughs> All right, now the main part of handling the waste solvents is to properly separate the solvents in the lab so that when you do go to purify them that they're as clean as they possibly can be because a big thing about recovering solvents is to make sure that you can get all the contaminants out so the less contaminants that are in there beforehand the easier it is to remove the contaminants that are there so if you're considering recycling your waste solvents the first thing to do is to have separate collection vessels for solvents that you only use for washing so acetone, ethanol, if you're just doing you know cleaning glassware in your laboratory or in your facility separate that out from the solvents that you're using in your chemical reactions or other various parts of your processes. Pre-separation of solvents is very important because um, it also gives you a better chance to get a higher purity. So as I stated before when, you, when you're purifying these solvents, you have to drop the pressure. And so dropping the pressure reduces the boiling point of the solvents that you have in there. And because of uh, azeotropic effects, if, there, if you do mix a lot of different solvents, you won't get as good uh, separation. So there are a couple ways to distill solvents. Um, so I'm going to touch on three different techniques within this presentation and the first one that I want to touch on is rectification and so re uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah rectification is more of an industrial type um, distillation but as you can see from this chart you can get high purity but the price for this process is extremely high so rectify this is a, just a an example of what rectification looks like. As you can see, it's very large scale. It's tremendous, takes up a lot of space. You need really massive amounts of solvent to even justify using this equipment. Uh, <clears throat> so you usually don't find these unless you're in like an industrial setting. And then the next way would be atmospheric. So atmospheric is there's no vacuum. You're just doing everything at atmospheric pressure to get the solvents off. And usually when I think of that, this is what it looks like. You know, this is what I did when I was in the laboratory, when I was in school, just setting up a small short pad distillation process, no vacuum at all, and you just you heat it up. You get a Bunsen burner, you heat it up, and it falls over into your collection vessel. Now with this there can be leaking uh, or even contamination outside of your original solution just because there's grease. The more grease you have, the more chance for contamination. And with this process, every single joint that you see in this picture is another point of contamination. Um, and then the last process that I want you to tell you all about is the vacuum reduced pressure process. So this is what we use here. What uh, we use here at Buki, um, using our rotor vapor, and the main reason we say that our process is better than these other two options is that, as you can see in the chart here, the purity and the price, as well as the ease of use, is just way better compared to the rest. And I can even jump back to the previous slide here. So as you can see, this pretty much lays everything out for you pretty clearly of how beneficial each process is, but it's also important to notice that 
all three of these different processes have very different sample sizes. So using the rectification, you need very, you know, large amounts of solvent to justify using this process. Although the purity might be really good, the price is still bad, and you have, a lot, have to have a lot of solvent. As with atmospheric, it's very small, and the purity isn't as good, but it's also the cheapest. But when I say small, I'm talking about you know, 500 milliliters of, of that nature. And when you get to reduce pressure, that's when our instruments come in. So the rotary evaporator is the more preferred instrument for this process. One, because us here at Buki, we've been doing it for about 60 plus years. We've got a lot of experience with it, and it's just well known within the industry. Using rotary evaporation for concentration is already widely used, so why not use it to purify your solvents as well. It's already been used to distill solvents over out of, you know, your original solution. And so work it under vacuum, reducing the boiling point like I mentioned before. And also we have an integrated vacuum controller. So that means, uh, as you can see in the picture here, um, the vacuum controller controls the vacuum very precisely so that when you do set it, there's not much fluctuation, which gives you maximum distillation rates, as well as multiple uses. It doesn't just control the vacuum, it controls everything about the instrument. And the rotor vapor can concentrate, it can even dry samples, and as well as recycling, as we're talking about now. Um, now, that we also get to the ease of operation. Literally, you put the sample in there, you put it on the system, and you press start. It's as simple, as simple as that. You can't get much simpler than that. Using the other methods that I mentioned before, things get a little complicated depending on the size of the sample. You can't even use your instrument. If it's too large, you might not be able to use the atmospheric here. You can have various size samples. I believe here at Buki, we can go from one liter on this size all the way up to 50 liters on this industrial instrument. Um, there are also different vario, uh, there are also various levels of automation too that allow you to control certain parts of the instrument automatically or it can be done manually by the user that is sitting there in the lab. And the biggest thing that I also want to mention is that the solvent is only coming in contact with glass parts and most of these glass parts you don't even need to grease so that's less contamination and there's less room for anything to go wrong because glass is inert so the chemicals that you do have in this instrument won't be reacting with anything to cause any harm or destroy the process. So, so how does it work? So first there are a couple parameters that I mentioned before one being the vacuum the next parameter that's important in this process is the rotation. So using a rotary evaporator, rotation is very important because it gives you a nice even surface area around the glass, increasing the surface area of evaporation for your sample. So if you just have it sitting here, which would be more like the atmospheric method, the only surface area would be at the surface of the liquid. That's where evaporation occurs, and that's where all you know everything would happen. But if you have rotation within the process, you actually have a thin film coating the glass, so not only do you get the surface area of the liquid, but all the way around the flask too. So this increases the rates of distillation and makes the process much, much faster. And this is due to the heat transfer. So rotation gives a nice, even heat transfer for the process so that one, you don't get bumping, you don't get foaming, and you get a nice, even, I mean, a nice high distillation rate. The next thing that comes into play outside of the rotation and the vacuum is the heating bath. So in order for evaporation to occur, even if the system is under vacuum, you still must put heat into the system. So whether it be heat from the ambient atmosphere or it could be heat from the bath. So when you use the bath, it heats up the sample and then you get 
your vapor temperature. So your vapor temperature is your target boiling point. Um, <clears throat> and then after that, you get the condensing effect. So the same energy that you put into the system must also come out of the system. And so that's what the condenser is for. You use the condenser to cool down your vapors, take the energy out, and then have them condense down into the receiving flask. Now here at Buki, we use a 2020 rule. So the Delta 20 rule, 2020 20 rule. <laughs> um, so basically you wanna have a 20 degree difference between the heating bath and the vapor temperature and then a 20 degree difference between the, heat, the vapor temperature and the cooling temperature. And this is basically like I mentioned before, the same energy that you have in, you want to come out as well. So it's important to have that balance so that you don't have vapors going through the system, past the coils and into your pump and worse out into the atmosphere because this can potentially harm the user as well as destroy the vacuum source that you are using. So another benefit to using a rotor vapor is the feeding tube method. So the feeding tube, you can have a tube connected to the inlet valve here that you see the green arrow going into from the, the recycling bin. So this allows you to introduce sample into the system without stopping the process. So you don't have to stop the heating, you don't have to stop the rotation, you don't have to turn off the vacuum. You can literally, once the solvent gets low, you can open up the inlet valve, the vacuum will naturally suck the solution into the system, fill in the evaporation flask. When it gets to an adequate level, you close the inlet valve and boom, process starts all over again. And it's a lot quicker than having to stop the entire process, lower the bath, take off the flask, refill it, then put everything back on, wait for the vacuum to drop, wait for the heating bath to heat back up, and then you can get the distillation again. This, this method, you basically just fill it and you're good to go. And uh, um, along with that is the draining feature. So you can fill the system while, while the system is still going through the process, you can also drain the solvent out. So the nice pure solvent that gets collected in the receiving flask, you can cut off one flask, one receiving flask, and have the sample going into the second receiving flask. And while the other one's being filled, you can drain this one of the pure solvent and you can even you know, send it out to the lab and then keep going right about your process. All right. And so optimizing your distillation, one good example is acetone. So if you, if you put the acetone in your system. These are the parameters that give you a nice efficient distillation of up to 19 liters per hour. So we have two different sizes of industrial water vapors. We have a 20 liter and a 50 liter. So 20 liter can usually fit about 10 to 12 liters of solvent. The 50 liter can work with a volume of 32 liters. So this is just an example to show you how fast you can process solvent within your laboratory or even the whole building, not even just one laboratory, the whole, <clears throat> the whole department uh, at your site. And then also with a focus on purity. So working at ambient temperature, you can get higher rates, but you have to put in a lot more energy. So even using just a slight vacuum can give you really good rates without having to use a lot of power to achieve those rates as well as achieving a high purity. When you work at higher temperatures you have a bigger gap within the boiling points of the different solvents so as you can see from the chart working at different vapor pressures with a different bath temperature can give you better separation. So as you can see the water and ethanol you know, 100, 100 degrees Celsius for the water and 78 Celsius for the ethanol, that's a 22 degree difference. But when you drop the pressure really, really low, you can, the, the, it brings the boiling points closer together. So it's really hard to separate those at such a low pressure. And I know a lot of people out there in the field, they think if you drop the pressure really, really low, you know, you get higher rates, but 
you also can get lower purity. So it's just something to think about throughout your process. Um, so we'll get into some of the examples here that we've experienced here at Buki. Um, there's a tech university in Vienna that actually uses, you know, they process 20 liters a day of solvent, which comes out to about 5,000 liters a year. Uh, you know, five days a week, 52 weeks in a year, give you somewhere around five liters a year. And it's important to see these numbers because they're saving this much by processing their acetone. So this is just the acetone that they use to clean the glassware. This isn't the acetone that they're using, you know, throughout every process. This is just the washing acetone. And so they're able to process 5,000 liters a year. So they're saving that because they're reusing this to continue washing in the future. So that's 5,000 liters of acetone that they did not have to buy. So if we look at the money aspect of this, you know, if a liter of acetone is $6, well, that's $30,000 a year for solvent. So you pay for the system in one and a half years. Just makes sense. So example number two is another university in Vienna. So they are actually processing solvents of acetic acid, heptane, dichloromethane, and they're running about 200 liters a month. Well, when you're working with solvents like this, that might cost a little bit more than acetone or ethanol, the savings can be more. You're talking about paying back your instrument in six months as opposed to a year and a half. So just look, you know, look at these examples. It really does put things in perspective. Um, we'll go to the next example here, the histology at the hospital that I mentioned previously at the beginning of the presentation. So this one is a hospital located in Switzerland. Um, and their applications for solvent recycling are for biological and medical fields. And they reported savings of about $18,000 a year. So they're processing you know, 4,000 liters of ethanol, xylene, and water, which is just huge. <laughs> a lot, a lot of processing. So the next example I have is uh, actually a cannabis user. So as I mentioned before, in the cannabis field, especially using chromatography methods, running lots of water and ethanol, different concentrations of both of those through these units, you get a lot of solvent on the back end of the chromatography process. And so when you're reconcentrating down your oils, <clears throat> You have a lot of solvent that's left over that most customers just throw away. Well, why throw that away when you can reuse it? Because you still have to separate other oil down the road. You still have to get at that crude oil and get the, the cannabinoids that you want. Well, might as well recycle it, use it for your process, save money in the, in the meantime, and it also means more money in the company's pocket or your pocket. Next, um, the last example. So this customer decides to remain uh, anonymous, but they do recycle um, solvents such as dichloromethane, and I believe maybe even cyclohexane. But um, in this case, this was an environmental lab. They used this for extractions and washing, and then they recycled the solvent that they use in those processes on the rotary evaporator, on the rotor vapor, the R220. Um, so this removes any residual water, also any small particulates that are left within the solution. And, you know, they were able to actually sell it. So they actually used the recycled solvent that they had from their process and sold it to a glue manufacturer. So they were actually making money off of their waste. So another way to save money is even if you're not going to you recycle the solvent that you have in your own process, you can also buy lower grade solvent. So if you buy the technical grade solvent, for example, cyclohexane here, if you buy the technical grade, which is usually like 80% pure, we'll use the rotary evaporator, purify it to 90% or higher, 
and you can save money that way because you're paying less to purchase the chemicals than you would have if you bought them at the higher purity. So a complete system for a rotor vapor looks just like this. You have the R220 Pro with the F325 chiller and the V600 pump. Um, I've included a lot of this information in the handouts. So there are three handouts connected to the webinar. Those can be located. I'm not sure if you all screen looks exactly like mine, but they should be at the bottom. There should be a tab that says handouts. So one of those is the R220 brochure. So it gives you information about the R220 instrument, as well as two optimization documents for optimizing your distillation process on an R220. One is interactive, the other one is only text. So if you can't get the interactive, interactive one to work, you can just look at the all text document, which is a couple more pages, because it has to separate out everything. But it, essentially, this is a complete system. It comes with the cooling for the condenser. It comes with the vacuum pump to drop the pressure. And then you have the base unit, which does everything else, rotation, heating bath, and has the draining, you have the inlet, but we also have different models of this. So we have a high performance model, which gives you higher distillation rates because you're able to heat your solutions more to give you a, a higher rate and pull out the, the same amount of energy as well so that all your vapors don't go into the pump and you're not losing your precious solvent, precious pure solvent. You actually collect it in the receiving flask as you intend. And uh, apart from the high performance, we also have the continuous system. So it goes along the lines of what I mentioned before about draining and inputting solvent into your process, except this does it automatically. So there are valves on the system that open and close that allow the system to automatically fill and drain your solvent throughout the process. So literally with this, you press start, and it does the whole process for you until you have no more solvent to recycle. All right, um, so I do want to thank you all for coming out to the webinar. So I will now open up the oops, open up the chat for questions if you guys have them. Um, okay, I accidentally put my window away here. So does anyone have any questions right now? <clears throat> All right, so um, I do see here. All right, so you do have the different couple of sizes that you can run for the road vapor. You can do, as I mentioned before, one liter up to 50 liters. We do have a 50 liter option. That's our biggest option. And you can put about 32 liters of solvent in there, depending on the weight. Um, and before I let you guys go here, I don't really see any other questions, but I do want to let you guys know that, one, there's a lot of useful information in the handouts that are attached to this webinar, so please utilize those, especially the um, RT20 Pro guides. There's a lot of information on how to optimize your process, as well as just understanding the fundamentals of the instrument as well, or even rotary evaporation as, as a whole. So definitely utilize those. And if you ever have any questions or want to contact me, my email is here, as well as you can call into this number here and ask for Donald. All right, I do thank everybody for coming out today. You guys have a great day.